Welcome everyone to the webinar, Sexual Exploitation and Trafficking of Youth. My name is Donna Schultz and I am the organizer for today's webinar. Today's webinar will be a great chance to learn about sexual exploitation and trafficking of youth. You will gain an understanding of the methods and types of exploitation, knowledge of common red flags, and risk factors of commercial sexual exploitation. You will also gain an overview of the basic steps of response to commercial sexual exploitation of children, reporting, and exit process. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies against engaged in elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, families, and friends, the general public, and all those whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. Before we get started, I want to go over some logistical information about this webinar. Throughout the presentation, your line will be muted. However, there is a chat box at the bottom left of your screen for your questions. Please ask questions or give comments throughout the webinar. Our facilitator will track your questions and after each module, answer any short and clarifying questions. At the end of the presentation, there will be a short Q&A. I will track your logistical questions and respond through the chat feature. The materials from this presentation will be recorded, archived, and posted on WICSAP website approximately two weeks after the webinar. If you are sharing a computer, a computer with a colleague to attend this webinar, please email the names of the other participants to Donna at WICSAP.org. This webinar will count as 1.5 hours of ongoing training credits, and you will receive a follow-up email from us for your records. At the end of the webinar, please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation. Today's presenter is Robin Meyer, who works as the Housing Program Programs Manager at Northwest Youth Services. She has served runaway and homeless youth in her community for the past 10 years in numerous capacities. She was a co-founder of a local organization who spearheaded community coordination and education in Whatcom County. Robin believes strongly that all young people are capable of living into their visions of the future with the right support and access. Thank you, Robin. Hi, good morning. Thank you everybody for being here this morning um, and for taking some time out of your Friday to learn about uh, sexual exploitation and trafficking of youth. Uh, first, I want to make sure that uh, credit goes where credit is due. So the content of this webinar was originally designed by Leslie Briner, who is a provider and educator in King County primarily. Uh, but has done an excellent job of creating a Train the Trainers program around um, curriculum, teaching uh, communities about how to identify and respond to commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth. Um, so uh, primarily the content was developed by Leslie Briner. Some elements of it were also contributed by Noreen Roberts, who's done an extensive amount of research around CSEC. Um, and so I am trained as a trainer of this curriculum. Um, it was originally a 40-hour training, um, which then was condensed to become a one-day training. And this morning we're going to cover it in an hour and a half. <laughs> um, and so I just want to acknowledge that this is a really uh, kind of truncated picture of this information. Um, and if you're interested in more in-depth training or information on any of the topics that we touch on, uh, many communities have full day trainings available uh, right now throughout Washington State. So I would um, keep your eye out for those opportunities. And it may be similar information, but you'll get the opportunity to go much more in depth um, on each topic.
So as was mentioned, the goals for today are that everybody who's attending gains a basic understanding of the methods and types of commercial sexual exploitation. Um, also that there's a general knowledge of common red flags and risk factors, and that you gain basic skills and knowledge to identify and respond to a young person who may be being exploited. Uh, as was also mentioned in the introduction, between each module, there are going to be five modules today. I want to spend the majority of my time at the end of the, of the session um, where we're talking about how to respond and work with a young person who might be being exploited. Um, it sounds like this is a group of advocates, and so I'm guessing that's really where your interest lies. Uh, a part of this training is talking about um, how do we even talk about the issue of CSEC um, accurately, and so that's going to be the first part. But again, I want to spend a, the predominant amount of time on the kind of the second half of this. Uh, but between each module, there will be a moment for any urgent clarifying questions because the information builds on itself. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page before we move on to the best of our ability. Um, and it looks like somebody's not hearing sound. Um, so hopefully we can get that sorted out uh, to the best of our ability. So if you do have a clarifying question about something I've said, uh, please feel free to put that in the chat box. So our first module is Definitions, Language, Data, and Framework. Um, this is obviously not a new issue to anybody. Um, sexual exploitation has been happening <laughs> of the, from the history of mankind, right? But the language that we use to talk about it and the framework that we think about it through has significantly changed over the past couple of decades. Um, when I first learned about this issue. I was actually working in South Africa, um, and the language was human trafficking, right? And it was before the World Cup in 2010. And so often when there's a big sporting event, people, people start highlighting this issue as, um, as a big, big deal that the community needs to respond to. And so that was happening in South Africa. Um, but the, the focus was on movement between countries, and it was, it was almost glamorized in a lot of ways. Um, and so we were, I was doing community education around what this issue actually looks like. And obviously as an outsider to the South African culture, um, I did a lot of learning from the folks who lived there. Um, and, and I think when we talk about what this looks like in our communities and our culture, the framework and the language that we're using to talk about it is, is crucial. So we're going to start there this morning. The federal definition of human trafficking is up here. You can read through the legal jargon. I'm not going to um, touch on every point in every slide because we would be here for, like I said, about eight hours. Um, but the primary takeaways from the top section are that um, if somebody is under 18, they're actually not able to consent to commercial, a commercial sexual act. Um, and if the person is over 18, according to the law, you do have to prove uh, forced fraud or coercion to have, to have it be considered human trafficking. Um, the definition of a commercial sex act means any sex act on account of which anything of value is given to or received by any person. So this can include the things listed below, so prostitution, typically what we think of when we're talking about commercial sexual exploitation. It can also include um, exotic dancing and stripping, pornography, gang-based prostitution, or any transactional sex with a minor. And so I want to pull that out a little bit. Um, Sometimes we think that cash has to exchange hands, or we define what is of value. Um, so again, a commercial sex act is anything of value. So that can be a place to sleep. It can be transportation. It could be a cell phone for any sex act. It doesn't mean that there is a pimp, and we're going to talk about this later, that um, pimp-controlled um, CSEC is one form of it, but there's also many other forms. So to meet the federal definition of human trafficking, any person under the age of 18 who is forced to exchange anything, any sex act for anything of value um, is considered human trafficking. Our Washington State definition, um, our Washington State law is actually commercial sexual abuse of a minor, CSAM. Um, there's the RCW for you. Um, and so it's a person is guilty of commercial sexual abuse 
if they actually pay a fee to a minor, or even if they agree to pay a fee to a minor or a third person um, believing that that person is going to be a minor, or if they solicit, offer, or request to exchange sexual conduct with a minor in return to a fee for a fee. Um, this is a Class B felony in our state, and these are typically where the cases are being um, prosecuted um, is under the CSAM laws. All right, so typically people want to know how often is this happening, how many people does it impact, Especially, um, I'm up in Bellingham, so in Whatcom County, that's a question we get, offered, get asked a lot. Um, King County, I believe you folks are from all over the state and even from some places outside of the state. Um, and so just to offer some numbers, again, these are going to be underestimates. Um, but there, there has been a significant amount of research done at this point, um, and more of this is available, and I'm happy to send out that information through Donna later. Uh, but the National, Missing, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2003 estimated between 100 and 293,000 children are sexually exploited each year. Um, a, a product done in 2001 found that 326,000 young people were at risk for CSEC in the U.S. A King County estimate in 2007 said 300 to 500 youth. Um, and then again, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimated one in six youth um, were at risk of sex trafficking um, or were likely sex trafficking victims in 2014. Um, in Washington State, there's a more recent uh, data, um, data project that's going on. So we're trying to collect just more up-to-date and accurate information about youth who either self-identify or who are in contact with service providers who identify. Um, and so we are hoping to have uh, better numbers and more accurate numbers in the next year or so. Uh, the reason, I'm sure many of you can guess why this would be an underestimate. Um, this is a topic that triggers a lot of shame for young people. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. Uh, there's very significant stigmas associated with um, sexual exploitation. Um, and then the other piece of it is that a lot of these studies, as they're conducted, um, actually require the youth to self-identify um, as somebody who's been sexually exploited. And what, as you'll find as we go through this presentation, a lot of times young people are not going to identify as a victim of sexual exploitation um, for, for many different reasons that are probably unique to each youth. So who does sexual exploitation affect? Who, who are the targets? Um, Again, when I first started learning about this issue and training on this issue about uh, seven or eight years ago, um, my approach in talking about it to communities was um, the message that this can happen to anybody. This is in your community. This is in your backyard. Your kids are vulnerable to this. Um, and, it, and really, that's a, that's a fear tactic, right? It's kind of like the boogeyman is out there, and, and he's going to come get your children, which does get people's attention, um, but it's not probably the most effective approach to talking about it, and it's not the most accurate approach either. Um, it, it really is the fear, the fear approach, the shock and awe approach, rather than talking about this as a justice issue, which ultimately it is. Um, so sexual exploitation affects um, young people of all genders, um, so girls, boys, gender variant, youth, um, all sexual orientations, any economic class, any race, and any education level. So while there's not any specific population of youth that are always going to be exploited, um, it does disproportionately affect young people who are already at risk or marginalized. So youth who are experiencing poverty, homelessness, and discrimination, particularly youth of color and youth, identi youth who identify as LGBTQ. There's a, some studies that have been done um, that find that when youth are asked to self-report or when youth are asked to self-identify, there are actually comparable numbers of boys and girls who disclose sexual exploitation. So again, that's that idea that um, vulnerable male identifying young people may be already marginalized in a unique way that puts them at risk 
to be exploited. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more later on in kind of the second half about what are the societal and environmental issues that put people at risk and how do we acknowledge those for what they are. Um, so while you, exploitation can impact any young person, there, there are populations of youth who are more at risk for exploitation. Language. So um, I, again, I doubt that anybody on this webinar um, would call a young person a teen prostitute. Um, but that, that does happen, right? And, and this progression of language has really happened, this um, evolving of, a lang of language as we've learned more about this issue. Um, so from prostitution, right, very common language to use in our society. Um, people tend to think they know what they're talking about when that word is used. An image comes to mind often. Um, and, and over the last 10 to 15 years in this work, the language has really shifted. So um, I would say in like 2007, 2008, the, the term that was being used quite a bit was domestic minor sex trafficking. And that was created for some specific reasons, right? Human trafficking began as this thought of you know, people being imported to the United States, moved across country lines. Um, there's a whole industry around it. And that's true uh, some of the time. And in some places, that's a much more prevalent form of trafficking than others. And so domestic minor sex trafficking really made an attempt to say, this is happening to young people from here in our own country, in our own communities, and movement is not actually necessary. Movement across cities, across states, or across country borders isn't necessary um, to call it exploitation or to call it trafficking. Um, since then, the, the language has developed even more away from sex trafficking um, and I think becoming more accurate, right, more, more, um, more true to the issue, right, that, that people are being sexually exploited. Um, and, it, and I believe it just helps us talk about this uh, better. <laughs> um, the rest of the words here, the rest of the language are, is language you might hear, so sex work, sex servitude and slavery, um, sexual exploitation of youth and young adults. Um, and then the bottom line, the life, working, dating, making money, that's language you might hear from a young person. And we're, again, we're going to talk about that more um, when we get to the module about how to work with a young person. Um, a big part of it is listening to the language that they're using um, and reflecting that back. All right, so a very important point to keep in mind as we move forward and talk about this issue is the idea of consent versus choice. So this is a part of the training that could easily be a whole afternoon. And again, if I'm talking to a group of um, advocates, I'm sure this is a topic that you have some foundation of already. So the definition of consent is to give permission or acquiescence of something done or planned by another. However, the thing to keep in mind with consent um, and in communities that are, that are learning about this issue, a big, a big question that comes up frequently is, well, aren't these young people choosing to participate in this? Aren't they choosing to use the drugs? And then because of that, they need to have sex to get the drugs. And, and there's this language of choice. There's this word choice that often comes up. Um, and, and what I don't have time to get into is the, the broader picture of um, you know, the way Leslie describes it is big C choice versus little C choice. So little C choices are the things we, we do every day, right? I chose to have tea this morning instead of coffee, or I chose to walk to work instead of take the bus. Um, the big C choice is do I actually believe I have another choice, right? If I don't have a vehicle, is taking the bus actually a choice, or is it what I have to do to get to work? Um, so for consent to be present, two criteria have to be met. The individual has to have the developmental capacity to reason the choice being made, and the individual must believe that they have more than one option in the circumstance to which they are consenting. Um, and so again, just please keep that in mind as we're talking about this issue, um, that this concept of consent versus choice is a really very relevant um, uh, lens to have uh, when we're talking about young people to other community members or when we're working with a young person who might be challenging our skill set. 
So the, the five lessons that really are the takeaway from this presentation, um, and number one and number five are my absolute favorites. Uh, the first one, relationship is the intervention. Um, there's, lo there's, a, there's lots of movies out there about um, trafficking, and they're very like rescue-oriented. Um, again, that may be the case one in a thousand times. Um, and that's not a hard fact, so don't quote me on that. But it's very, it's much more rare that a young person is going to ask to be rescued from a situation. Um, the change in the intervention is going to be through relationship and through a young person feeling safe and feeling like they have other choices and other options to move into. Um, number two, address the sub subculture. Um, I, I like to change that first word from address to acknowledge. Um, address kind of implies this, um, that you, you need to change something about it. Um, I would say you need to be informed about it and you need to be respectful of the subculture that that young person is involved in or identifies with. Um, but you're not in charge of changing it for that young person. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done where you can talk about things through that lens but that means educating yourself and acknowledging that that is something that the young person identifies with, whatever that subculture is. Number three, reframe the economic strategy. So if a young person has found that this is a very effective way to make money and to stay alive or to get their basic needs met, asking them to give that up is essentially asking them to not survive. <laughs> um, and so if you're somebody who is working with a young person on a longer term basis, or if you have a relationship with a young person where you could start to address other ways they could get those needs met, it increases their ability to make a true choice. Um, and so again, this is one of those pieces that I wish we could have hours to talk about because it's one of the most, um, I think, exciting parts of this work is when you see a young person find new options and have confidence in their ability to make money or get their needs met in another way. Number four, develop partnerships and know your systems. So uh, as service providers, a big part of being able to support youth who are being exploited is knowing what resources are going to be supportive and effective for them and knowing the people that are doing that, that work so that when you make a referral, it's a successful referral. And number five, this is the long game. So uh, in, in domestic violence, arenas, um, we talk about how it often takes people many times to leave a, a violent relationship or an unhealthy relationship. Similarly, in homelessness, we talk about it takes people you know, five to seven times of experiencing housing for it to actually stick. So this is not a one-time intervention. This is a relationship-based intervention. All right, any quick clarifying questions? I don't see any that haven't been addressed. Thank you for answering the Q2I in there. Um, okay, so I will move on. The second module is about methods and type of, types of exploitation and some social and cultural contexts that put people at risk for exploitation. Types of exploitation. The first one, uh, and this is the one which traditionally or historically is the first one that comes to mind, right? We, um, we think of a pimp or a third party trafficker. Uh, oftentimes in, our, in that image that is very um, ingrained <laughs> in our culture, the pimp is a male, often a male of color, um, and the victim is a female. Um, that is potentially one type of exploitation situation, uh, but I, my hope in this training going out far and wide is that we continue to expand um, our definition and our understanding. So there's gang-based exploitation. Uh, in our area, we do have some gang activity. It's not as prevalent as it is in other parts of the state. Um, and so my experience is much more in the survival sex, independent, or peer-to-peer -peer exploitation. Um, but when I've talked with folks working where gangs are much more um, visible or active in the communities, you know, the conversation is around, well, if they're, if they're uh, trading or trafficking drugs or weapons, um, that's a one-time sale versus when it's uh, sexual exploitation. 
um, somebody can be sold over and over and over again. And so it's actually a product that doesn't disappear. Um, so it's much more financially lucrative for those gangs to use um, humans um, to be what they're, what they're selling. Uh, Family-based exploitation, um, this happens a lot in, when folks are living in poverty, right? So if, if a family needs to pay the rent, and one way to do that is to have their child sleep with the landlord, that would be commercial sexual exploitation, right? Going back to that original definition, anything of value being traded for any sexual act. Uh, survival sex. Um, this again is when a young person would trade maybe a sexual act for a place to sleep or a meal or transportation or a phone. It's uh, people um, selling something to get something that they perceive that they need, to get a basic need met. Um, this is where the overlap between runaway and homeless youth and uh, sexually exploited youth is uh, really, really significant. Um, that is my experience is working with homeless youth. And when we started doing some of the research here, some of the data collection, um, many, many of our youth have experienced this and, and don't often even identify it as exploitation. Um, and thinking about that through that big C versus little c choice lens, right? If they don't perceive there's another option, then of course this is what they're going to do to have a safe place, a quote unquote safe place to sleep for the night. Um, so independent or self-managed with the development of the internet and cell phones and all kinds of websites. Um, when a young person is looking for some money or for a basic need uh, and they're presented with an option where that need can be met extremely quickly um, that in you know, five minutes they can take a picture, post it on a website, and get a phone call and have 100 bucks. Um, that seems like a really viable option. Um, and if that person's already vulnerable and marginalized, again, they may not see that they have many other choices. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer, so um, young people exploiting each other. And then exploitation through other forms of the sex trade, so strip clubs, webcams, private parties, and again, I'm not going to focus a ton on that portion of it. Um, we're going to stay probably in the top few definitions here. Uh, the Internet is a really, really uh, big part of all of this. Um, it's fast, easy, and visual communication where basically a whole huge network of people can have access to, um, to buy young people. So risk factors. I think about this as um, kind of concentric circles. So individual risk factors um, would be a history of abuse or neglect. There's been some studies done where um, I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but up between 70 and 80 percent of, of people who self-identify as um, survivors of sexual exploitation also report a, victim, a history of abuse or neglect. Um, mental health issues, family dysfunction, homelessness, as I mentioned before, that overlap is really significant. Immigrants, people of color, young people, girls, women, LGBTQI, low IQ or development asset, developmental assets. So all of those things are, are obviously, and that list could go on for quite a while, um, those are things that would make an individual more vulnerable to somebody who wanted to exploit them. Environmental factors. So if the adult sex industry is, is active and on the surface, or even if it's kind of underground in your community, that's going to be an environmental factor that impacts um, this issue. So um, in Whatcom County, we, our coding laws don't allow uh, for strip clubs. Um, however, there are houses, right? So it's, um, there are houses that function as brothels or strip clubs, um, whereas in Portland, um, Oregon, the strip club, club culture um, is much more surface, um, and so there's a different market there for um, sexual exploitation. Um, places where there's transient male populations, substance abuse, poverty, obviously we talk about the systematic um, or cultural things that are leading to this being a reality. Violence, um, use of bo women's bodies in media and advertising, right? There's a sexualization of people in general. Um, the glorification of pimp and hoe subculture, I am still baffled by this, and I think about my own experience in college um, 
and uh, I was and I was studying a social justice at the time, and I think this is how people work, right? Studying social justice, and I was invited to a pimp and hoe party, right? And it and I went, and I think we do that, and we don't see the connection. Obviously, that was that was quite a while ago, and I would hope that now, knowing what I know and seeing what that feeds into, I would make a different choice. Um, but this is what is is glorified and glamorized in our society. Um, and then proximity to borders and ports does um, present additional risk factors for um, that cross-border trafficking or cross-border exploitation. And then as the concentric circles get larger, we talk about just what are our social dynamics that make this, um, make this possible even. So um, privilege and racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, classism, inaccessibility of legal economies. So again, when people don't see that there's other options, um, and somebody presents a quote-unquote option to them uh, to survive, um, that person may end up in that situation um, though they didn't have maybe perceived other choices. So busting the boys myth. Um, I think this is changing now, but uh, for the past while when I've been at trainings or conferences about CSEC. Uh, there's gendered language <laughs> uh, just everywhere, right? We say she, we say her, we say the girls um, who are being exploited. Um, and this slide was uh, developed by Noreen Roberts who has done a significant amount of research on the prevalence of male identifying youth who um, either are identified as being exploited or who have self-identified as um, being exploited. Excuse me. So this is where some of these myths come from, right? Uh, the myth that most boys identify as gay or bisexual. So in the research, um, compared to the U.S. population, disproportionately high numbers of sexually exploited boys do identify as sexual minorities. However, in most of those studies, the majority of sexually exploited boys identified as heterosexual. What we know about buyers of sex is that they are mostly male identifying individuals. And I say mostly. Um, there are certainly exceptions to that. And so if a young male identifying person says that they've been exploited by another male, the assumption that providers tend to make, and I think we're growing here, is that that boy identifies as gay or bisexual. Um, and on the previous slide, when I mentioned uh, societal risk factors, is that we are still a very homophobic society. And so a boy may not choose to report or discuss this because they would fear being perceived as gay. The second myth um, is that boys identify themselves as hustlers or choose to engage in the sex trade and are not victimized in the same way that girls are. Um, so we talk about this, again, similar to boys maybe reporting uh, sexual assaults, right? There's the, the common questions that unfortunately they might be met with of why didn't you get away? You probably liked it. You were probably the initiant. All of those things um, still happen, and or they have happened for so long that that male identifying youth uh, have have fairly good reason, unfortunately, to be cautious in how they report. Um, for similar behaviors, boys are often criminalized um, differently than than female identifying young people. Uh, so because this is often a source of shame, um, boys, you know, the myth is that boys would try to redefine themselves as hustlers. Um, but girls do a very similar thing, right? They're, they can brag about the money that they make or the lifestyle that they lead um, and start to embrace terms like ho or bottom bitch. Um, I, I would offer that that is a really, um, it's a way of coping, um, is to take control of the situation and redefine it um, so that there's a sense of control and empowerment in it um, and that's not necessarily a gendered thing, but our perception is that uh, male identifying youth would, would brag and would be the, the hustler or the one in control uh, because of our, our norms at this point. 
And the last myth is that boys do not come forward um, or are not identified as CSEC because they're just, they're just not out there. Um, <laughs> the research shows otherwise. Um, and there, I do have a slide that is unfortunately not included here because it's so tiny, people can't actually read it. Um, but it covers about 10 studies um, where 10 studies across the country over the last 10 years. And what's consistent in the study is that it's about half and half um, young people who identify as boys versus young people who identify as girls. Um, and, and some of the reasons that have been found that boys don't actually come forward and will often even actively deny sexual exploitation is the cultural context that we've been talking about, fear of being outed as gay or perceived as gay. We spoke about that one too, that we still live in an extremely homophobic society. Um, that that wouldn't be a safe thing to be perceived as. Um, uh, youth may not think that service providers serve males even when they do. So um, the story that <laughs> I've heard is, um, you know, there was a there's a safe house that uh, says that they serve boys, um, but their logo is, you know, their name is like Sophie's Sophie's house, and the logo is flowers and butterflies, and it's pink and purple. Right, so it, it's reasonable that a boy would um, maybe see a website or look at a card or a flyer and think that they might not serve males. Um, so it's really important as we're talking about services and how we market the information that that's gender neutral information. Um, and even that we specifically say, you know, serve all genders because we can't expect somebody in crisis to, um, <laughs> to really, uh, we just need to make it very, very accessible um, and, and state the obvious, if it's obvious. So um, boys are not believed when they do come forward. Uh, and in my work here, I've unfortunately seen that happen many, many times. Um, we were working with a youth who uh, is, a, is transgender and they went to seek out services and shared about a situation that they were really uncomfortable with. Um, and the response that they got to that request for support was, what, what do you expect us to do? Like, what, this is your lifestyle. Um, and so they, they said that they were not interested in ever going back to that place to get support. Um, so I think we need to really acknowledge the risk um, that, that youth are taking when they do ask for help. Um, and hopefully we can create services and systems that are uh, really equipped to honoring and respecting um, when a youth does self-identify or does disclose um, that, they per that they feel they're being exploited, um, including boys um, and transgendered and gender variant young people. Um, sometimes screening's only done with girls. <laughs> they don't even ask the boys the question. Um, or CSEC street outreach teams only frequent the female track. Um, so in, in larger communities, um, this is fairly common that there's a female track and a male track. And so if you're only doing outreach in one location, of course you're not going to be seeing the males. You, you need to find out where that is and what that looks like in your community. And subculture. Um, so that, that point, I think it was the fourth point in this, the five takeaways, address the subculture um, or acknowledge the subculture. So a subculture is a group of people within a culture that differentiate themselves from the larger culture to which they belong. They attach to rules, norms, language, clothing, decorations, practices, attitudes, and beliefs reflected in that subculture. So subculture can be a, a difficult thing to overcome, um, and I don't think it has to be overcome. <laughs> I think that's often the, the perception is that we need to change it, right? And um, that's why I don't love the word address. I think acknowledge it because it also can be a source of strength. Um, if somebody has values that they attach to because of that subculture, those can be translated to serve that young person, right? Even if previously they've been used to exploit or um, uh, keep that young person away from options or away from having choice. I think these things are often learned or taught. So if a young person has been street homeless for a number of years, 
there are norms, there are link, there's language, um, there's practices that have become uh, a part of who they are and who they identify as. Uh, and one that <clears throat> you're, you'll ultimately see a lot with um, youth who have been exploited or are being exploited is the, um, the don't snitch. <laughs> and this is true of um, homeless youth too, uh, that protecting each other is a primary value. Um, as a service provider, we are outsiders. <laughs> we do not understand their experience. And this is where it can be really uh, beneficial to have um, peer advocates who have experienced what that young person has in maybe some form. Um, and they might be able to speak to the subculture a little bit differently or honor it differently or ask, ask questions, ask more informed questions. I think the best way to learn about the subculture, uh, like I just mentioned, is ask questions. Let the youth inform you of what, um, what they ascribe to. And, and you can listen for how those, those things, how those norms or how those attitudes um, could be translated to help the youth have other options. All right, that's the end of our third module. Any clarifying questions on anything from module two? Okay, I'm going to move on. Again, there'll be Q&A time at the end. <coughs> Excuse me. So red flags, this is a big part of what I think everybody wanted to learn. Um, you know, the question that's often posed is, how do I know? Um, oh, I do see a question. Thank you. Uh, so what did I mean by perceiving the difference between male and female tracks? Um, Sometimes in a community, it can actually be different location, right? If so, if um, if people are being prostituted outside, like in you know, kind of this image that comes to mind, somebody walking the street or being outside in a community, the location of the in the community might be different uh, for females than males of where they where people are going to congregate. Does that answer, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so red flags, um, things that might lead you to believe that somebody's being exploited. Um, chronically truant, runaway, homeless, gang-involved youth. So <laughs> uh, again, the overlap between runaway and homeless youth and youth who are being sexually exploited is huge. Um, youth who are chronically truant from school or gang-involved youth, the likelihood that um, they are at risk for exploitation is extremely high. Uh, people having multiple cell phones. Um, youth who have been in this life for a long time are extremely smart, right? Young people are extremely smart in general. Um, so they might have one cell phone that is for their family, one cell phone that's for their service providers, and one cell phone that's for working. Um, and so if you ask for their phone number, they're probably going to give you like the service provider phone number, right? Um, but they may have a number of other phones that they use um, in this work. Um, having expensive goods or services that they cannot pay for, so showing up with brand new phones, brand new clothes, fancy jewelry, um, and the story doesn't quite line up about how they got that. Um, this is, I think, for service providers, one that we really want to ask questions around very quickly, right? Like, oh, where'd you get that phone? Or That's, those are nice clothes. How'd you pay for that? Um, those questions could be fine or they could be perceived as judgmental. Um, and I think there's, there's a way to address those things that can that can um, open up the conversation and a youth could be maybe able to share something with you that they haven't shared before. Uh, excess amounts of cash, hotel room keys, um, signs of branding, tattoos, or jewelry, lying about age or false identification or inconsistencies. Uh, this is the one I would say we see the most often and for me is the biggest red flag is just um, inconsistencies in stories. Right, or having a very quick answer to questions, or having an answer to um, any question that you ask. Right, there's there's a prepared answer for it, and it doesn't necessarily line up with um, an answer they gave before or a story that was shared before. So this is where developing that relationship with that young person can be really helpful. Because sometimes, if you have established that trust, you can actually reflect that back to them. Um, 
and you're, you're not necessarily challenging their truth in that moment or what they're sharing with you. You're just showing them that you're paying attention and you're listening. Um, dramatic personality changes, evasive behavior, especially around a new partner, a new group of friends. I think you can summarize that as just you know, paying attention to their habits and their patterns. And when that changes significantly, that might be an indicator that, that something has changed in their environment. Um, lack of knowledge of a given community or whereabouts. So if somebody has been moved from a different community and there are these, um, there are these routes, right? There's these, these uh, loops that basically people are taken on from Seattle to Portland to LA to Las Vegas and then back. Um, and so if somebody doesn't seem like they know where they are um, or kind of local landmarks that, that most people know, that could be an indicator that, that they've been moved here. Um, and then provocative clothing, clothing, sex toys, lots of condoms, lube, or other sexual devices. Um, I think in the next slide or two we talk about just the hypersexualization um, or inappropriate uh, sexual offerings in, in spaces. So if you're in a drop-in center or a shelter, um, you know, is there this, this hypersexualized behavior? <clears throat> uh, different ways to identify somebody. So you could ask specific questions during the intake process. Um, I'll give you the words for those questions in the next slide. Um, increasing attempts to, a, to track youth that are chronically running away um, and or truant. So Children's Administration now has um, uh, CSEC liaisons as well as um, people that actually work to find the youth who are actively running away. And from, from the conversations I've had, the majority of those youth are being exploited. Um, again, similar to the last slide, consider significant behavior change. So just paying attention to those things as you get to know somebody. Um, asking about STIs, pregnancy, or unexplained injuries. In my experience, this is, again, one of the uh, easiest isn't the right word, but um, most effective routes in to <coughs> a conversation where you can show uh, you can um, you can show safety, understanding, and you can actually address very practical needs, um, and that can be a a very trust building experience for a young person. Um, I was working with a youth who uh, was in one of our shelters, and she often would come in with just some new really significant injury that she said, you know, she had gone to the hospital for the night before. And um, just week after week after week, um, and what we would do is we would address that injury, right? And we would drive to the hospital, and we'd follow up with medical care, and we'd have these little um, snippets of conversations that, you know, she continued to share those with me and, and trust me with that. And the story of each injury was always a little bit different. Um, but what they did is they led to opportunities to safety plan with her, right? So um, how can we avoid that injury this time, right? And, and I think it's just these very practical routes in to offering support. Um, so hypersexualized behavior. Um, and then observing communication patterns in school, clinics, drop-in centers, street outreach settings, who talks to who and who doesn't. So our street outreach team here is really aware of kind of wh who are the groups of people, who's talking to who, um, who hangs together, who does not hang together. Um, that can give you pretty valuable information about what a youth might be experiencing. <coughs> I think the reason we don't ask the question sometimes is because we don't want to offend the young person. <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't want to offend the young person, and we don't want to sound like we're judging them. <clears throat> um, a, a youth that we were working with um, had been showing a lot of signs, a lot of um, you know, kind of the red flags were popping up for a number of our staff. And finally, somebody you know had the courage to ask, like, "Hey, are you having to trade sex to get a need met?" And they just they just looked right at the staff and said. Of course I am. I've been waiting for you to ask. Um, and they thought it was rather entertaining that we were so nervous to ask them. And they opened up and they started sharing about their experience. Um, and they were very open to safety planning and engaging in some harm reduction conversations. Um, and we got to keep a really honest and open relationship with that young person. 
So it's good to kind of reflect on what would be your hesitation in asking this question. Sometimes people trade sex for money or because they have to survive. Has this happened to you? Or an alternative way is, or is that going on in your life? Um, so, so think about for yourself, what would be your hesitation if you ask, in asking that question of a young person sitting in front of you? Um, often the response that I get is the hesitation is like, well, what if they say yes? <laughs> um, and I, I think if they say yes, then, then first of all, they've expressed to you that they trust you, and you can build from there. Again, this is not a rescuing situation, unless that youth is asking to leave in that moment, and then you can go, you can look for emergency shelter options or safe house options. Um, but most of the time, that's not going to be the case, and so they've just entrusted you with some really personal um, information that you get to then build with them um, around. So if you're putting it on an intake form, we've added this to our application. Um, have you ever traded sex for money or things you need to survive? By putting it on there, even if no youth checks yes on that, you're normalizing it, um, and not normalizing it in the way that it's acceptable, but you're normalizing it as in you're making it a safe space that if a youth does want to talk to you about that, they know that you're comfortable having that conversation. You are educated that this is something that youth experience or that, that happens to youth, um, and you're comfortable talking about it if they ever want to. Um, then this last one, I'm wondering if you are in the life. I will not judge you or anything you tell me. I'm here to listen if you ever want to talk or want support. Um, that last part is great. The first part, I'm wondering if you are in the life. Um, you know, if you underline that last line, in the life, uh, you listen to the language that youth is using. Some of the youth may use that term in the life. Um, some of them will say, I'm working, or I'm hustling, or whatever it is. But just listen to the language they're using and then reflect that back. Um, I think the most important part is this last part. I will not judge you or anything you tell me. I'm here to listen if you ever want to talk or want support. Uh, the other reason people are really hesitant to ask this question, what if they say yes, is the question around, is it considered um, something that has to be reported under mandated reporting laws. It is. Um, so I believe advocates are mandated reporters. That might be an assumption, sorry. Um, it's good to let people know that if you are uh, before you have a conversation, right? So that they can make a choice around what information they want to share. <clears throat> um, so if somebody reports being exploited and they are a minor, it is a mandated report. Um, and CPS may intervene in that person's life if they're under 18, if they're being exploited by any adult, familiar or non-familial. Um, how your agency wants to navigate this is really up to your agency. Um, it does get tricky, and I wish I could go into more of that, but um, Children's Administration does have, um, they do have CSEC liaisons who any call that screens in as CSEC will be routed to them to help assess. <clears throat> okay, so we're on to the fourth module, and I'm a little behind on time. I want to speed up just a bit. Are there any clarifying questions before we cruise? I'm not seeing any. Okay, fantastic. So the impact. Uh, physical health impact. So obviously if somebody is being exploited actively, if they are having to sell themselves repeatedly every night or all, all the time during the day, um, there's going to have, they're going to have some health impacts. So physical health impacts that you may see, lack of care to vision, dental, physical, and mental health, educational losses, so their engagement in school may be minimal, um, loss in wages, or belief that the life is the only job for which they're qual qualified. That ties back to that third bullet point of reframe the economic strategy. Um, I feel like we could just spend the whole time on that slide. <laughs> um, so after a while, um, and probably very quickly, uh, a young person might not feel like they have much value or much purpose or worth beyond what they're doing or how they're being exploited. Um, right? They're being objectified repeatedly um, and assaulted repeatedly, and so um, to regain uh, opportunity or <laughs> go get a different job um, is, is a big step. And I think one of my favorite things about working with young people is how resilient they are. Um, and so there's a lot in a young person to build on and to, to help them recognize 
Um, but yeah, the loss in wages or belief that this is the only thing they're good for is really common. Um, cognitive issues from trauma, drug use, or injury. So traumatic brain injury is really common. We actually have youth who report that before they'll report a sexual assault or identify as being exploited. They'll report um, a, a traumatic brain injury from, from a head injury. Um, and then also pregnancy STIs or chronic gynecological health issues. Um, these are, again, usually what youth will sort of initiate the conversation through. Uh, somatic issues, so numbing and desensitization. Um, we're going to talk about that in a couple slides around PTSD, uh, malnutrition, and then physical injuries. Mental health impacts, uh, PTSD, that's the next slide. Disturbances of self or identity, decreased self-esteem, guilt and shame, substance abuse, aggression or antisocial behaviors, and high-risk sexual behaviors. Um, I would offer that many of all of these are um, you know, ways that, that a young person is coping with what they're, um, what they're experiencing. Symptoms of PTSD, uh, we are not, I don't know if anybody in this group is uh, qualified to diagnose. I am not qualified to diagnose, but what I can watch for is behavior. Um, so PTSD, I'm going to read the short version here where it says it's a normal reaction to abnormal events. So um, being sexually exploited repeatedly um, is an abnormal event. And so if a youth um, is either uh, dissociating or becoming hyper aroused, um, those are really normal reactions for what they're experiencing. And so the dissociation or avoidance symptoms could look like depression, guilt, lost memory, um, emotional or physical numbness, loss of interest and checked out. Um, when, I, when I train uh, service providers, the thing I like to think about is, you know, we ask youth to show up to appointments, uh, which means they need to remember what day it is and what time it is and when that appointment is and where they were supposed to go. Um, and when we are in crisis, when a young person is in crisis or when somebody is experiencing something traumatic and they're dissociating, orientation to time and day <laughs> goes out the window fairly quickly. And so um, anything that can be done to help support a youth in remembering those things or not shaming them if they've forgotten, uh, giving lots of opportunities for somebody to be successful uh, it's very easy to assume intent when a young person forgets an appointment or doesn't show up on time. We, we say things like, oh, they're lazy, or they were busy, or something else was more important, um, or this wasn't a priority. Like, we have this list of things we go through, um, and maybe they genuinely didn't remember that conversation because they were dissociated. <laughs> and so we, we need to have the conversation again, or we need to reschedule that appointment without judgment. Um, so giving lots of, of opportunities for a young person to be successful is a huge, it's a very effective way of creating safety. Um, Re-experiencing the symptoms, so having flashbacks, bad dreams, intrusive or frightening thoughts. So if you're working in a shelter or a drop-in space, you might see this um, more than somebody who's just um, having very quick interactions with young people. And then the hyperarousal symptoms, so jumpy, edgy, paranoid outbursts, um, trouble sleeping or eating. Um, for both of these, um, it's, it's thinking about uh, a really helpful thing to do is think about what, be, what, be, what is the young person trying to accomplish through that behavior, right? And if it's association or checking out, they may be trying to literally separate themselves from what they might have to go and do in an hour or what just happened an hour ago um, because staying present in that is, is too painful or might make them feel like they are literally going to die. And so checking out whether that's their brain adapting to that need or whether it's through the use of substances, um, you know, when we think about it like that, it's, it's actually a fairly normal um, response. And the, the abnormal event is that they are having to, um, having to do a sexual act to get a basic need met. Um, so as providers, we should expect to see this, right? We should not actually have the expectation that young people are going to show up and have it all together and show up on time and um, be really present. I think we should expect that, that their brains are working on, on overtime um, to be present and to talk with us. And so showing gratitude and appreciation and honoring of those things also can help create a safe space and trusting relationship. Okay, any clarifying questions 
from Module 4. I'll give just a minute here. Okay, doesn't look like it. Great. Module 5, Interventions and the Exit Process. This is where every single one of these slides could be like two hours of interactive conversation. And I would much prefer it that way, but we're going to do it webinar style. <laughs> um, so guiding principles of engagement, uh, maintain a compassionate and non-judgmental attitude at all times. So some examples I shared before, if a youth forgets an appointment or shows up late or um, doesn't come at all or doesn't call you when they said they would, uh, how do you interact with them in a non-judgmental way that doesn't assume their intent in that action? Or if they share things with you, potentially about a pregnancy, right? And maybe they have a num they've had a number of pregnancies before. How do you interact with that information and with that young person in a non-judgmental and compassionate way? Uh, not responding with, oh, that's wonderful, or oh, I'm sorry, right? Find out how that youth feels about it. Um, ask, ask questions. Um, so be consistent. Follow through on everything and do not make promises that cannot be kept. Uh, <clears throat> Youth who um, are being exploited become extremely skillful in um, both testing people for who's safe and who they can trust, as well as keeping themselves safe <laughs> um, to the best of their ability. And so if you are not following through on the things that you say, uh, that trust can be broken very quickly. Um, and it's much better to be honest when you can't do something um, than, than saying you can than not being able to. Build trust, then relationships. It's very slow. Trust happens through lots of small interactions. So again, this is not a one-time intervention. Very rarely is it a rescuing situation. Uh, cultural competency. Be sensitive to the unique cultural needs and experiences of each person. Um, be aware of your own bias and cultural worldviews. So um, going back to that, acknowledge the subculture, <laughs> whatever that is, and almost in every situation there's going to be many different subcultures that a young person identifies with. So learn about them, ask questions, and be aware of your own bias um, and thoughts you have going into this. Self-determination and empowerment. Youth should have information relevant to their situation and be encouraged to make informed decisions whenever possible. Respond to youth as survivors. Uh, in in CSEC language, <coughs> you'll, you'll probably hear both survivor language and victim language. Um, when it comes to talking about the laws, um, a young person may need to be referred to as a victim. And when you're talking with a young person, I think it's much more empowering and respectful to uh, talk with them as a survivor. Um, but I think this is also one of the situations where it's really wise to listen to the language that the young person is using and either reflect back to them that language or ask if they have a preference of what language they'd like to use. Relationship building. So um, though each young person is unique, and I, I believe direct service is an art form, <laughs> uh, there are techniques and patterns to it. The first step is, is almost always rapport building, right? So getting to know somebody, um, offering information, not prying, um, learning somebody's name, some things that they like. Uh, they may need to show up a few times before actual engagement occurs, right? So you, I was at a trauma-informed care training last week, and the trainer actually recommended doing a safety walkthrough of your office. So from an outside perspective, you walk through the front door and the question, I loved that she used this question. She said, the question every person is asking is, is this place for me? Right? So what does somebody see that's going to tell them if that place is for them or not? Um, and they may need to step into that a couple of times and test it. Trust building, so being consistent. Show up and be present. Um, offer choices, so going back to that big C choice versus little c choice. The more opportunities that we can provide a young person to make true choice, um, they'll get experience doing it. They'll get practice doing it. And we know how our brains work and how our brains learn new things. We actually need to practice those skills um, in non-crisis times to be able to use them 
when we're in crisis or when we're in unsafe situations. Uh, expect testing. Oh man, <laughs> these kids are amazing at testing um, because in many ways their life depends on it, right? Their life depends on what are you going to do if I tell you this? Are you going to call the cops? That might make things really unsafe for me. Are you going to judge me? That's going to make things really unsafe for me. And so if their priority is survival, and that's where the brain is at in its coping skills, in its engagement with others, and in staying safe and staying alive, uh, they're going to test us. And so just be prepared for that. And going back to the previous slide, engage with that testing without judgment and with compassion. Relationship building. So this is where you'll probably see that switch from it's you calling, it's you texting, reminding, um, reaching out to now the youth is maybe reaching out. The youth is saying, hey, can I meet you here? I'm really hungry. Can you, can you help me find food? Right? They might be putting a little bit more of themselves out there. Uh, in Leslie's training, she, I love this analogy that she uses um, of breadcrumbs. Right? Uh, youth often will uh, leave little breadcrumbs to, to test and to see, are you going to pick it up? Right? And that might happen in the trust building stage. And then in the relationship building stage, some of those breadcrumbs are going to start kind of stringing together. And the story might make a little bit more sense. Or they might share some more background of like, oh, I, did you know I was actually, you know, I experienced abuse as a child? Or this is what my, um, this is what my mom was like. Uh, you're going to get a little bit more consistency from the young person. Um, and this is really your opportunity to, uh, to enter into advocacy, right? Because you have the information. Um, and again, I bet you guys all know this, but a big part of that advocacy is asking what the youth would like as support, right? We can't necessarily make those assumptions that we know the path out for this young person. And then the last stage, support system building. So leveraging your relationship to increase the youth support system. So if they have begun to trust you, who do you trust, right? And sometimes that can be law enforcement, right? If you have an officer in your area or a detective in your area that you know and trust and who is educated, Rather than saying, hey, let's report this to the police, um, you can say, hey, I know Sarah. She's a great detective. Would you like to talk with her? Um, and hopefully Sarah could come to your office in plain clothes and sit down with the youth um, and isn't going to show up with a notepad. And you know, It's building that system in your community um, so that you're not the only supportive relationship and um, opportunities for that youth can grow. Stages of change. All right, this is, this is the good stuff, man. Um, so this is a cycle. You see this is not linear. Um, you can expect a young person to go through these stages a few times. Um, yeah, this is, this is like a full, a full day. So stages of change, pre-contemplation. You might hear things like, I love my boyfriend or partner, and I love being in the life, right? So they're not interested in changing. They don't see a problem. Um, contemplation, you may hear or see things like, you know, I, I like my partner, but there's some things I don't really like. And there's some stuff I don't really wish I had to do. Um, so there's specific goals with each of these stages. So the goal at the pre-contemplation stage would be like planting seeds. You're not trying to push them or convince them that their partner's bad. You just talk about the future. Talk about what, what are they looking forward to? What, what's ahead for them? Um, contemplation, you're connecting them at this point to an advocate or a mentor who can listen and be present and build that trust. Preparation or action, you might hear things like, you know, I, I don't really want to do this. I don't, I don't want to die doing this. Or I don't, I don't want to do this for my whole life. Um, this is when there, there is opportunity for action, presenting options, um, offer a lot of services, offer alternative housing options if that's a need. Um, counseling is a great thing to offer here. But just getting, letting them know that those services are available and if they want them, helping that person make those decisions in that moment. And then maintenance, I'm working on my goals and staying out of trouble. So this is when lots of positive support and reinforcement, planning for a relapse, um, and planning for the future. And then relapse, right? This goes back to the, um, this goes back to uh, um, that PTSD response, that hyperarousal, um, or kind of the dissociation, right? So a youth might say, I miss the drama, I can't make it in the square world, right? This isn't working for me, or this is too hard. Um, you support the youth, you stay with them in a non-judgmental and um, compassionate way to help them re-engage, stay flexible, and you let them know that you are not disappointed and that you are still supportive and in relationship with them. 
safety planning, um, I'm going to bop down to the very bottom here, right? I, I think you guys are probably all trained and experienced in safety planning. But this last part here, mini plans, short, frequent, and as specific as possible. Um, and then following up on them as well is really important. Um, but yeah, being specific, uh, I think this, this often happens at that um, relationship building stage, right, where they've trusted you maybe with enough information that you can do safety planning accurately. So in the example I gave about the youth I was working with who had just would show up with lots of medical stuff, lots of injuries, you know, she never actually told me that she was being sexually exploited, but she talked about partners and situations and unsafe locations that she was, you know, in her words, she was having sex. Um, and so we did safety planning around how she could end up with less injuries or how she could maybe have more control over the location. Um, and so again, it's being non-judgmental about the topics you're talking about. Um, some of those in the second to last bullet point there, um, young people may still keep working, even though you've been working with them as an advocate for a long time. Um, and so how do you talk with them about uh, having condoms, having a doctor, um, working in familiar places, screening their buyers? Some communities have a bad date list that's created, um, where actually uh, people who are, um, you know, quote unquote, in the life, basically come up with a list of unsafe buyers. Um, so it's it's really being open to talking about what's practical for that young person. Harm reduction is an approach that's going to be essential in this. Um, I kind of mentioned it in that previous slide. So just what are the practical steps that um, you can talk about with a youth to be safer um, while, they're, while they're moving through this process? And then motivational interviewing. Um, this is something that can be happening at every single interaction. Uh, and the key components to it are open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summarizing. So you're showing that you're present, you're showing that you're listening, um, and that allows the young person to lead their own process, um, which ultimately is going to be what makes it successful, uh, keeping in mind that um, stages of change process, right? This is not often a one-time exit process, but the more um, safety planning, the more um, support options, uh, and that, you know, reframing the economic strategy, as those things are growing, youth can make, they can, they can find their path. Um, if you're not sure if a young person is being exploited and maybe they haven't uh, shared that with you or they haven't dropped any breadcrumbs or you're not really concerned about them doing motivational interviewing with anybody you're interacting, interacting with, it really is not going to do any harm. So it's a great approach and I would highly encourage people to go get specific training around motivational interviewing um, if you want to be more skilled. I definitely can't train you in um, 10 minutes on motivational interviewing, but these are the kind of the core components of it. Uh, so the Going back to that first module, uh, relationship really is the intervention. And I would say that's one of the most wonderful things about this work and one of the most challenging um, is that we can't rescue, right? And, and you will hear extremely traumatic stories um, and you will watch youth step back out into the world where maybe from your perspective they're going to experience harm. Um, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we can't stop that from happening in that moment necessarily. But what we can do is we can be present for them to come back to um, and, and keep coming back to. Um, and so just in, in all of this, remember that relationship is the intervention and this is the long game. Uh, the last slide I have is just in that, in that strand of, you know, if you've been doing this for a long time or if you're fairly new to it, just that you have your own practice um, of responding to trauma exposure, um, that you know what your response is to trauma and that you inform the people around you um, so that you can develop your own support system. Um, coming up with your self-care practice, movement is great, mindfulness, 
um, reflection, gratitude, connection to others, um, because this, very, this really is um, very challenging work um, to stay really present and non-judgmental with the young people that trust you. Um, so yeah, I think the last thing I want to say is just understand why you do this work. And, and if you needed to take a break or if you feel trapped, um, that's probably it's probably impacting how you're interacting with young people. And so going back to the top of this slide, just know your response to trauma and work on your support system and your self-care practice. That is all I have for you today. We've got about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Or questions and discussion, maybe, more accurate. Robin, can you see Nancy's question on the chat box? Uh, yes. So is it fair to say that when you reach maintenance and stay with that, it may oftentimes prevent relapse? I would say sometimes. I wouldn't probably say oftentimes. Um, you know, this is where we can probably take a, a note from the um, treatment and like substance abuse treatment and recovery world um, is that relapse is a part of recovery. Um, and so I think especially if somebody is newly exploring what it would mean to uh, leave the life, uh, you can expect more relapse um, and probably more frequent. Um, but it's honoring every step of that process and not um, discounting, you know, even if those stages are happening back to back to back day by day, right? And it may be that quickly, um, or it might be over months. So the timeline and the frequency that somebody might move through those stages, I think, is really individualized to each person. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is that as somebody moves farther and farther away from that, from their experience of exploitation, that that maintenance stage can last longer, right? And that relapse hopefully wouldn't have to be a part of it at some point. Um, but yeah, I think in the, in the substance abuse world that the thought is that you're always kind of planning and preparing on how to prevent relapse and it, it is a part of recovery. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Robin, for presenting this great webinar. As a reminder, please fill out the short evaluations and let us know if others were on the webinar with you. You can email that to Donna at Wixap.org. A recording of today's webinar and materials will be posted on our website under Trainings and Recorded Webinars. Thank you. Thank you so much.